Today on America's Test Kitchen, Dan makes Julia the ultimate holiday sugar cookies. Adam reveals his top pick for parchment paper. Lisa reviews silicone baking mats. And Lon makes Bridget the very best lemon bars. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. The problem with most holiday cookies is that they either taste great, but they look a little rough, or they're beautiful and taste like cardboard. So obviously we set out to develop a recipe that both looked and tasted good, but we also wanted it to be easy because making holiday cookies is supposed to be fun, Dan. It is supposed to be fun. <laughs> so holiday cookies are all about tradition. Mm -hmm. We decided to question every ounce of tradition <laughs> when it comes to making them. Sounds like a good holiday party. We really wanted to kind of rework them and see if we could come up with the easiest cookie that baked up nice and flat on top with a really tender, crisp interior. I'm in. All right, so let's start with our wet ingredients. I have an egg here, and I'm going to add in a teaspoon of vanilla. Vanilla is a classic flavor for these. If it's missing, you would definitely tell. We've also got three quarters of a teaspoon of salt, and then just a quarter of a teaspoon of almond extract. Just a tiny amount. Tiny bit. If you use too much, it would overpower the cookie. Mm -hmm. It tastes like marzipan. But we found <laughs> that a little bit actually kind of brings out the flavor and the complexity of the cookie. So I'm just going to whisk this together. Okay, perfect. That's great. Let's move on to our dry ingredients. So we're starting with two and a half cups of all-purpose flour, and we're gonna add a little bit of leavener. So if you had a lot of leavener, mm -hmm. you get a really puffy, tall cookie, not what you want for holiday cookies that you're gonna decorate. Right. You want a nice, flat surface. That makes sense. So we're sense. gonna add a quarter teaspoon each of baking powder and baking soda. And then I'm just gonna whisk this together. Okay, great. So we've got our wet and our dry. Now it's time to look at our sugar and our butter. Mm -hmm. So in most traditional cookie recipes, we'd be creaming this. We'd have a stand mixer out here. We'd have butter that we let sit at room temperature until it got to about 65 degrees, right? And that's so we can incorporate lots of air when we beat it together with the sugar. We're not gonna do that here. <laughs> totally out the window. Out the window. I'm gonna start with the sugar. And so we found when we made this recipe with just straight granulated sugar, that kind of a grainy texture to it. And the reason is there's not a lot of moisture in this cookie, right? No, there really is We saw isn't. how much went into it. So there's not a lot of water to dissolve the sugar. Ah. We also tried with confectioner's sugar, which dissolved very easily, but it ends up making a really dense, hard cookie. We wanted something in the middle, and we found that super fine sugar, which you can buy at the supermarket, works great. Mm -hmm. You can also make it really easily in your food processor. So we've got a cup of granulated sugar. I'm gonna process this until it is powdery, which takes about 30 seconds. Okay, so that's 30 seconds. This is reduced to a nice powder, which is fantastic. So we're gonna go in with our butter, and it's nice and chilled, right out of the fridge. We're gonna do a technique called plasticizing, which you see when we make croissants, and we beat the butter and make it pliable, but mm -hmm. it's still really cold, and that's gonna help us with rolling it out, you'll see in a second. And that can happen in the food processor. It can, we can use the blades instead of, you know, kind of manual action. So this is 16 tablespoons of unsalted butter mm -hmm. cut into half inch pieces, and it's nice and chilled. So I'm just gonna process this for about 30 seconds until it's plasticized and incorporated into the sugar. And scrape down if you need to to make sure there's no sugar hiding out. Okay, that looks great. Next goes in our liquid ingredients. Yeah, this is totally backwards from making a traditional cookie. We're going crazy on this one. This is only 10 seconds. And now for our flour. And you can just add all the flour at once. I'll add it all at once. Okay, so we're gonna process this again, again for 30 seconds. We're looking for it to come together, no dry flour, but it's still gonna be a bit crumbly. Okay, that looks great. So let's pop over here. I'm just gonna dump this out on the board. Bring this together, really briefly needed, about 10 seconds here just to bring it all together. Boy, that looks like a nice dough to work with. It is, it's really nice. So, I mean, it's a tiny bit tacky, but it's really nice. So this is where the recipe really gets crazy. I'm gonna split this dough in half, and then normally at this point, softened butter would be so sticky. Yep. We try to roll it or anything like that. It's sticking to our rolling pin, it's a total mess. We're actually gonna start rolling this out now while Love it's still it. warm. Normally, take it out of the fridge, it's hard as a rock, right. we're it. We're gonna totally avoid that. So I'm gonna start you out on a piece of parchment here, and we're gonna start by using our hands. We're gonna try and get this down to a seven by nine inch oval, okay. just by hands, and then we'll do some more parchment and we'll roll the rest. Beautiful, All seven right. by nine. All right, yep. so now we're gonna take our second sheet of parchment. All right. And that goes on top. Just flatten that out. And now we're gonna switch over to our rolling pin. Mm -hmm. You can roll as you would with a rolling pin, but a really nice technique that we found is actually this pressing motion where you start in the middle yeah. and you push out. So you can do a combination of the two. We're gonna look for a 10 by 14 inch oval here. Really, we're trying to get it down to an eighth of an inch thickness. 
Looks great. Yeah. All right, awesome. So we're gonna stack these up. So we're not gonna cut the cookies now. We're not. We're gonna chill before we cut, and that's gonna help us get really nice clean edges. Yeah. It's gonna be a lot easier to transfer them to the baking sheet. We're gonna put this in the fridge now until it's nice and chilled before we cut it. It'll take about an hour and a half. All right. So Dan mentioned that plasticized butter is the key to this recipe so that you can roll it out right away without chilling it. Now, what is plasticized butter? Well, a lot of the fat in cold butter is in the form of big crystals. When we pound cold butter with a rolling pin, or in our case, chop the butter up with the blades of a food processor, we break those large fat crystals into smaller crystals. And it's the smaller crystals that make the butter more malleable so we're able to roll out that dough right away. So this has been an hour and a half and it's nice and chilled. I'm going to give you your dough back. A couple cool tricks here. We're gonna first peel off this top layer. All right. Which comes right off. And then we're gonna put it back on. And okay. Ah, then we're gonna flip then it over. Then we're gonna flip it over. I know this trick. You know this That's trick. That's so the dough doesn't stick to the bottom piece of parchment when you're cutting out the cookies. And then take this top one off and we will get rid of this one. Now we're getting the real fun. We're gonna make some shapes. Um, so I have a triangle and a square. Mm -hmm. I give you a star and a circle. Oh, yeah. Thought you liked those. So we're just gonna cut them out and then um, transfer them over to our cookie sheets here. Okey doke. This has really great airflow across the whole surface. We get really great results. So there is a reason for cookie sheets. There is, yes, we don't use them very <laughs> much, but cookies, time to use them. We wanna get as many as we can out of here. So the good news is you can definitely re-roll what's left. Oh, good. Yes, yeah, so we can re-roll it, flatten it back out, and then you just wanna chill it again before you work with it. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Most of the decorating we're gonna do after the fact, but I really like the sugared cookies too, yeah. where you just get a nice covering. You wanna do that before you bake them. Okay. So basically, you wanna use a nice heavy hand and really cover the top. You can smooth it out if you have a big pile of anywhere. Don't worry about getting it on the sheet. Okay. It's, a, it's a pretty low oven and we're not gonna bake for that long, so it's not gonna burn or brown. All right, so just give it a nice thick coating. Yeah, that looks beautiful. All right. Beautiful. Okay, let's bake yours first. So okay. We're gonna go into a 300 degree oven on the lower middle rack, and we're gonna bake them for 14 to 17 minutes, rotating halfway through. They're gonna get just lightly browned on top. We don't want them to get really dark. Ooh. Oh, I love that smell. So buttery. They look beautiful. So Thank these are you. gonna rest for five minutes like this, then we'll get them off the sheet. In the meantime, we're gonna bake off the second batch. All right. So we have some beautiful cooled cookies here. Mm -hmm. We can eat the sugar ones right now, but these other ones are looking a little plain. So I think we want to decorate them. Fun. And for that, we need a royal icing. So this is the traditional topping for these cookies. It dries to this gorgeous kind of matte finish. And we are not breaking from tradition at all for this. We're going really, really classic. So I've got two and two thirds cups of confectioner sugar in the bowl here. And I have two large egg whites, half a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and eighth of a teaspoon salt. So it's really clean flavor. Mm -hmm. It's really about that sweetness and, and the beauty of it. Just a little vanilla. Just a little bit. We're gonna start this on medium low so we don't kick confectioner sugar <laughs> all over the kitchen and it'll just come together in about a minute. So now that that's come together, we're gonna turn it to medium high and we're gonna whip until we get nice soft peaks. Okay, so that's been three minutes and we'll take a look. Nice soft peaks there. All right, we're good. Now, if you are worried about using raw eggs in this frosting, you could substitute pasteurized egg whites. I'm gonna set aside a half a cup now. We're gonna use it for a really cool technique called flooding Ooh. in a second here. So I'm just gonna transfer about a half a cup to this measuring cup here. All right, I'm gonna do the transfer here. Mm-hmm, there you go, nicely done. Now, before we get into piping, I just wanna show you this cool technique. So we've got the half a cup of reserved icing, mm -hmm. and then this is one teaspoon of milk. Just a little. It's gonna thin it out just enough that we can fill on the inside of the cookies and get those beautiful, mm. like, flat finish. Yeah, it's almost like a mirror finish. Exactly. Beautiful. All right. All right. So we're squeezing all this gorgeous icing to the tip. Yep, exactly, squeeze it down. And then twist it. So I'm gonna pipe a little border for my, my squares here so that I can flood them. Okay, so I piped my border there, and now I'm just gonna take a little spoon of my flooding liquid here, go right in the middle, and then I'm using a toothpick, spreading it to the edges. So just take it right out to the edge. So for the flooded ones, you wanna let the first level dry completely mm -hmm. before you pipe over the top. Okay, so now we're gonna get really fancy here. So I've <laughs> got these beautiful dragees. Mm, they're like a, pearls. Yeah, they're, aren't they gorgeous? You can get them in all different colors, and I'm using some tweezers here. <laughs> yes, you are. Because I, there's no way my fingers would make this work. That's what's great about these cookies. I feel like you can make them as easy, mm -hmm. sugar top, or as fancy as you want them. It's really up to you. Love it. Okay, so we'll finish decorating the rest of these, mm -hmm. and then they just need to dry for another hour and a half and then we're ready to eat. Okay.
Well, Dan, these look really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible, right? They are gorgeous. They weren't fun to make. They don't look good. They're not going to taste good. No, they're they're absolutely beautiful. And so I just want to show you before we dig in and eat. So this is the one that I flooded. It is beautiful. Let it dry, and then you just go over the top. And oh. you can design on top, but it, you get this nice height to it. You going to eat that one? Yeah. Mmm. <laughs> Tastes oh, buttery good. and light. Has a little bit of good chew in the middle, but it's crisp on the outside. That's so good. What I love is the cookie. Obviously, it has great structure because it's nice and flat and mm -hmm. it has good edges, but it still eats really, really mm -hmm. nice, right? It's tender, crisp. It's it's perfect. Dan, these are delicious cookies. Well done. Thank you. That was fun. That was fun. So for perfect holiday cookies that taste good, look good, and are easy to make, start by processing the sugar until finely ground, then add chilled butter and plasticize it. Then add the egg along with some vanilla and almond extract before adding the flour. Roll the dough out while it's still soft, then chill it until firm before cutting out the cookies. After baking the cookies, let them cool completely before having fun with all sorts of cookie decorations. So from America's Test Kitchen, our new recipe for easy holiday sugar cookies. I'm gonna go in for this guy next. You need a round one. Uh huh. Today we're celebrating a real unsung hero of the kitchen. It's parchment paper. Adam's here, he's gonna tell us all about it and which one is best. I like the thought of me as the unsung hero, Bridget. I think about you all the time. <laughs> oh, not thank real. you very much. <laughs> all right, what I would like you to do to start is just tear off a nice neat piece of parchment paper from that roll all to right. line that baking sheet. All right, because that's what you use it for. That's right? what you have to do. You want it nice and neat. Yeah. <laughs> and therein lies the rub. Real That's problem. the problem with a lot of parchment products for home use. We tested 10 different parchment products. Seven of them were in rolls, mm -hmm. just like plastic wrap or foil. Sure. Three of them were pre-cut sheets. We did a whole lot of baking to test these things, including baking pumpkin jelly roll cakes, thin, crisp gingerbread cookies to assess their release in the browning, as well as pisala jer, which is that anchovy and caramelized onion pizza in a 500 degree oven to assess scorching and brittleness. More tests covered handling, rolling disks of cookie dough between parchment sheets and using parchment sheets to tightly roll a baked jelly roll cake both to assess sticking and wrinkling, and using the parchment paper to line tart shells, filling them with heavy pie weights for blind baking, and then lifting the paper with the pie weights to carry them around the kitchen to assess the strength and the durability. And they conducted some at-home testing with volunteers who used the parchment to bake chocolate chip cookies and also stored the rolls and the sheets in their home kitchen cabinets and drawers. So you're saying not a lot of testing. Not a lot of <laughs> testing on this one. Well, right. it's cookies, Bridget. Exactly. We have to make as many cookies it's as true. possible. All of these parchment products performed well on the baking test. So really what distinguished them was the ease of use. Mm -hmm. And that got down to two things. Number one was size. The standard baking sheet that you have there, the rimmed half sheet, is 12 inches wide. Only one of these rolls, of seven, was 12 inches wide. You'd think that would be the default size. Wouldn't you? Yes. All the others were 13 to 15 inches wide, so if you managed to tear off a sheet neatly, you then had to trim it to fit into a half sheet pan. Non-starter. Now the other problem came with the packaging, and that is, tearing off sheets neatly, just like the one that you were trying to do at the right. top of the segment. I mean, this box didn't even have a proper cutting edge, and the box was so flimsy that by the end of the testing, it was all stretched out and misshapen. Trying to get a nice, neat piece of parchment out of this roll was like an act of futility. The three pre-cut sheets were a little bit better, but they also had some packaging issues. This one, they're all folded inside of the box, but you can see, when I put this down, look at those deep creases. Yes. The creases were distinct even when we tried to flatten them out, and when testers rolled cookie dough in these pieces of parchment, those creases imprinted the dough with lines. These were rolled up inside of their box, which is great, but they were sort of resistant to flattening out. Like, they were really hard to flatten sure. out. Sure. No, I've actually baked goods where the edge curls back up into the cookie or the cake that I'm making. Not good. Very irritating. Yeah. The third set of pre-cut sheets were the runaway winner of this testing. These are the King Arthur Flowers Baking Parchment Paper Half Sheets. They were $19.95 for this bag of 100, plus you have to pay for the shipping. 
They come in this big zipper lock bag so that they're not rolled up, mm -hmm. they're not folded, you can store them flat. Now, you know, it's a large package, so you have to find an empty drawer, maybe the top of the fridge. But I'll tell you, these things perform beautifully. They were sized to fit into a baking sheet with no trimming. You never had to worry about any of the, like, cutting nonsense. It's as close to commercial parchment as you can get. Exactly. Well, exactly. there you go. Well, if you fancy yourself as a little bit of a Sir Bakes a Lot, you're going to need King Arthur Flowers baking parchment paper. $19.95 will buy you 100 pre cut sheets. Silicone baking mats are an alternative to parchment paper. They're convenient and reusable. You can just pop one into a baking sheet and you instantly have a nonstick surface that you can use, wash, and use again. We tested five mats priced from $9 to $25, comparing them to our favorite parchment paper. We baked a lot of cookies, and we also tested them against an online baking sheet roasting potatoes and salmon. The good news is that these mats are very easy to use, and they also stay very flat because they're heavier than paper. This is great for delicate cookies, where you want everything to stay very level. On the downside, the slickness of the mats sometimes made cookies spread a little bit too much. And over time, they all got a little bit oily and retained some odors. So we really preferred mats that we could put into the dishwasher so they could stay cleaner. The size of the mat was also important because some of them were slightly too long or too short. Our favorite, though, fit perfectly into a standard half-size baking sheet. This is called the DeMarl Silpat US Nonstick Half-Size Baking Sheet. It's $22, and it's our top choice. I know I'm supposed to go gaga over chocolate desserts, but I love anything lemon, lemon. Ice, lemon pie, jack lemon, even those lemon candies, you know, the kind that rip up the top of your mouth as you eat them. But lemon bars, not so much. They always look like they're gonna be lemony. They're yellow, but they never taste like lemon. But luckily, Lawn is here, and she's gonna put the lemon back in the lemon bar. Sure am. So <laughs> when I was developing this recipe, the lemon lovers like yourself made me a little crazy. We can't have enough. Well, hopefully I've satisfied your desire for lemon. All right. Before we can get to the filling though, let's talk about the crust. Okay. Instead of the usual shortbread style crust, which was a little too crumbly, we're gonna go with something slightly different. Okay. It starts with a cup of flour. I've got all purpose flour here. A quarter cup of granulated sugar and a half a teaspoon of table salt. All right. I'm just gonna whisk that together. I'm using granulated sugar here instead of confectioner's sugar, which you see in a lot of recipes. Right. The coarser sugar is gonna give our crust a tiny bit of crunch. Last up is our butter. I've got eight tablespoons of melted unsalted butter, and I'm just gonna stir that in. As you can see, it's a really pliable, almost batter-like dough. Yeah. We're gonna be making our lemon bars in an eight by eight pan. And I've lined this pan with two foil strips. That's gonna make cleaning up and getting the bars out of the pan a lot easier. Right. Now I'm just gonna press everything into place. I wanna make sure that the bottom layer is very, very even. I wanna make sure every bite has just the right amount of crust and filling. Now I'm just gonna pop this into a 350 degree oven. I've got the rack set in the middle and it's gonna bake until it's dark golden brown, 19 to 24 minutes. Okay. So our crust has come out of the oven. It's a nice dark golden brown. And we don't actually have to let this cool all the way. We can just keep going, okay. dump the filling in. So for that filling, I've got two thirds of a cup of lemon juice and two teaspoons of lemon zest. And those ratios aren't actually radically different from what other recipes use. The secret ingredient, it turns out, was cream of tartar. It's a dry acid, so you don't have to bind it with any extra binders. Okay. So I've got two teaspoons of cream of tartar and cream of tartar is actually tartaric acid. And what it does is it sort of tricks the lemon lovers into thinking there's more lemon yeah. in there than there actually is. Because it provides more puckery flavor. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'm going to add a cup of granulated sugar. I have two tablespoons of all-purpose flour and a quarter teaspoon of salt. Just gonna whisk that all together. Next up, I have three large eggs and three egg yolks and these provide most of the binding power. The flour is just kind of a little extra help. Okay. Um, and you absolutely do have to separate eggs for this. If you use too many egg whites, it ends up tasting a little bit sulfurous and mm. eggy. Eggy. Kind of distracting. We're not looking for a lemon omelet. 
it's nice and smooth. Mm. I'm just gonna add that lemon juice. That was two thirds of a cup. Okay. And the lemon zest. Just gonna whisk that all together. Now, I'm not going to just pour this into that crust. This filling would take probably 40 minutes to bake through, and over that time, the edges are gonna overcook while we're waiting for the sender to set. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to jumpstart this filling. Got a medium saucepan here. Cook this at medium-low heat until it reaches 160 degrees. This is going to take five to eight minutes, stirring constantly to prevent the bottom from curdling. Okay. Looks good. I'm looking for 160 degrees. There you go. Perfect. I'm gonna move this off heat so it doesn't keep cooking. Okay. And I'm going to add four tablespoons of unsalted butter. Yes, now it's a curd. Just gonna stir until all of that butter's melted. Mm. The butter's gonna help cool this as well, and it's gonna just round out the flavors a little bit. This looks great. That is beautiful. Now we are going to strain this mixture and that's to make sure that if there are any curdled bits, we catch them and that lemon zest that's in there, we're done with it. It's right. given up everything it's gonna give to our lemon bars, so let's get rid of it. So right into mm. our eight by eight. Doesn't that look beautiful? That is it's like sunshine in a pan. I'm just gonna tilt this pan to smooth it out. There's no need to try to even it out with a spatula. Okay. And I'm just gonna pop it back into that 350 degree oven just until it sets up. We'll jiggle the pan to make sure it's done. That'll take eight to 12 minutes. So it's been about 10 minutes. Let's take a look. All right, how's it looking to you? It looks great. The edges are just starting to puff, just right. a tiny bit. Let's Ready get to go? this out of here. Now we have to exercise our patience. <laughs> this has to cool for that filling to set, and it's going to take about an hour and a half. Yes. All right, I hope they're cooled enough. They certainly are. You ready? I sure am. So that sling we made earlier makes taking these out so easy. I'm going to cut these into 12 bars. And I'm gonna wipe my knife clean in between slices. Now I love that there's some resistance in that crust too. I can tell it's gonna be nice and crunchy. Right. Beautiful color, look at that even crust right there. And gorgeous. All right, first bite. That is gorgeous. That lemon flavor just lingers and lingers and lingers. It does, but it's not too tart. And that crust just comes through. You get the bits of crunch. Mm -hmm. It's kind of buttery. You get this almost toasty flavor underneath. And the texture of the curd, it's like butter. These are packed with lemon. Thank you so much, Lon. Well, if you want to make these lemon-packed lemon bars, it starts with stirring melted butter into the flour mixture. Press into a pan and bake to create a tender and crunchy crust. Cook lemon juice, zest, and a little cream of tartar, our secret ingredient, along with eggs on the stovetop or over that crust and then finish in the oven. Cool, slice, and devour as fast as possible. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a true lemon lover's delight. Believe me, the best lemon bars. I'm speechless. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.